This is Johnny Dosco. Stay tuned for another score sheet podcast. Holy Kadelka. Hello, and welcome to another score sheet podcast. Happy to say that we have with me today Ian Lefkowitz, who is a longtime score sheet player and also has been doing a bunch of work for Baseball Prospectus, all with a score sheet bent. How are you, Ian? Hi, I'm doing well, Jeff. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Well, sure. Thanks for taking the time to be with us. Glad to talk to you. Ian and a couple of his friends, they have a weekly column on the Baseball Prospectus website that is pretty specific just to score sheet advice. They also do a weekly podcast that talks about all things score sheet. So it's just kind of another benefit if you happen to both play score sheet and subscribe to Baseball Prospectus. So you guys are, um, I'm sure, dishing out draft advice these days. Yep, uh, we are gearing up for draft season. We've actually just finished up our positional previews for keepers, and we're now focusing on the draft, which is certainly uh, my favorite part of the season, except for the part where I get to watch actual baseball. Yeah, watching games, watching real games is fun, but the draft, I, I just think it's the best part of fantasy. And, you know, trying to decide if you're going to really go in, all in on Chris Bryant or if you're going to stick with an old Adrian Beltre or something, those are the kind of decisions that are just fun. Yes and yes. You're going to go happy all to... in on Bryant and, and you think Beltre has one more year left? Yeah, ha- ha- happy to provide some really top-notch specific advice there. Yeah, exactly. Those are the types of questions that really are compelling and for me as an avid baseball fan you know my favorite rounds start to be the uh the 30th round and late 20s where you're really deciding between your reliever or that fifth man or the sixth infielder who you've heard might have a chance to start it's kind of a level of depth that you don't get in any other product yeah i think that you know, I know that most of the millions of people who play fantasy play in much shallower leagues than score sheet leagues. You know, people play in 12-team combined leagues, whereas most people in score sheet play in 10 or 12-team leagues that draft just from the AL or just from the NL. And I think that means that the average score sheet customer is more of an in-depth baseball fan, I, I guess to put it. Yeah, that's fine. And probably uh, better looking and a little smarter, too. <laughs> better looking, for sure, looking at you and me. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, you know, the draft, is it's kind of funny. There's some people like me. I got to admit, I'm just not a prospect guru. I've been burned so many times by reading articles that I'm I'm kind of on the Beltre side of the fence. You know, if a guy's on the older side of 30, I'm liable to get him because I like him more than most guys in my draft who are going after the 22-year-old who, of course, they often beat me by doing that. But there's something to be said for a guy who's got five, six, seven years of track record. Yeah, for sure. You know, that's kind of been the eternal dilemma. Uh, one of the ways in which we have been able to get back to the score sheet community is we've participated in this off-season mock draft each year, which uh, I think you can find if you uh, Google score sheet mock draft, you'll be able to find the rankings. You have to subscribe to the group. This year, for example, we drafted more, I would say, late 20s, early 30s than we ever have in the past. We found that that was where the value was compared to prospects. When we say that we've been burned by prospects in the past, I think it's, we have a tendency to remember that just as much, if not more, than being burned by players or mid-career players. You know, everybody is a volatile asset. There is no safe place you can go. Mike Trout can slip on something tomorrow, knock on, you know, some industrial product. But I think when it comes to a prospect, we all just remember that moment where they don't make the majors. Sure, they're a little more risky, But I think I would never advise someone to avoid prospects entirely. No, I think you're quite right about risk. There's, um, you know, Albert Pujols was about the most solid as a rock kind of guy you could see. And he signs that big contract. And, you know, basically his first year, he's just half the player he was because his foot hurts. And I think he was as safe a pick as anyone could have made. Yeah, I mean, each year you have these mid-career solid players. You know, someone who drafted Prince Fielder may have said, oh, he's declining, but I don't think they predicted the neck injury. I don't think people predicted that Joey Votto would be harassed and injured into this kind of semi-oblivion that he's in. And, of course, I think Fielder and Votto are probably now value players going into 2015. But, you know, I think... I'm going to interrupt for a second because Votto is one of my... I've had more people tell me that they're not going to draft Votto this year. If I was doing 10 brand new drafts, 
I think I'd probably get Votto on all 10 teams because I still have him as one of the best players in baseball. And it's incredible how people seem to lower the value of a guy just for one kind of injury plague year. For sure. Especially when it, I think, plays into certain expectations that people have of Joey Votto, where you hear he won't hit for power or he gets hurt a lot. And then he has a year where he doesn't hit for power and gets hurt a lot. And it's like, like people are now kind of see that as the player. But he still has probably as good a chance to have a 400 on base percentage as anybody in baseball. And I'm a huge on base guy. In fact, I, I had a discussion with a guy that works here some about the Houston Astros today. And they've made a big splash, but. They seem to have done the exact opposite. They've almost punted the on-base percentage category, and they're getting all these guys that hit home runs and strike out. And I'm kind of the opposite. If Votto doesn't hit a ton of home runs, if he has an on-base percentage of 400, I'm very happy, just like I was. I happened to have Chu a couple years ago, and you know, on base percentage, there's just there's a guy on base all the time for you. Yeah, and Chu is another controversial guy. We actually dealt with that on our podcast this week certainly some of the same markers and on the other hand you have somebody who i see as perhaps more controversial someone like evan gaddis as you i think we're kind of implying who i think many people feel is probably a better catcher candidate than i do we had him relatively low in our positional rankings i think still in keeper territory in most standard leagues but certainly towards the back of that list and not an automatic keep no, I think that, you know, there's, I mean, going back to Moneyball even, which when they were talking about on-base, but all the sabermetric studies, you know, the serious people, they all say on-base percentage. And the people that play score sheet that have played a long time, they all value on-base percentage more than slugging percentage. Because just having guys on base is how you score runs, really. The way the simulation is set up, the way you have set the simulation up, certainly to mimic real life, I think in some ways on-base percentage may even be slightly, although pretty infinitesimally, more important in the simulation than in real life. Because you have, you know, especially with some of the slower players, there are fewer gradations of speed. So certainly a player who's guaranteed to get on base is really kind of a sturdy asset and helps turn your lineup over, which is important in simulation. Yeah. No, you want to... You want to do that. Well, I think that, you know, back to this risk thing, there are guys that, of course, we all know we should maybe stay away from a little bit. You know, Hanley Ramirez, if, if you're going to get hurt six years in a row, when someone calls me in July and says, I don't have a shortstop, Hanley's hurt again, I'm kind of like, you know, <laughs> if, if you draft Hanley, maybe you should make a backup shortstop be a real priority. You know, whereas if you draft the Albert Pujols guy and you don't draft a backup, then you kind of got a gripe, I think. But, you know, as a drafter, you you do have to look at your team and go, huh, I've got an injury-prone third baseman. I need a backup third baseman a lot more than I need a backup left fielder. Yeah, and I, I think pivoting to the draft a little bit, you know, especially in most standard leagues, I think that the draft is really the place where you make those decisions. Now that you have your team, if you have a team of keepers, you have to understand, okay, I kept Hanley Ramirez. That impacts my team in a certain way. I know that I will have a fielder who misses perhaps 30 games during the year and who won't be a shortstop in 2016. So do I take that young shortstop? Do I take Gene Segura if he's left on the board? Do I look for a high-level shortstop, perhaps like Jonathan Villar, and hope that he comes through with some playing time? Yeah, no... I mean, that's part of the complication of giving draft advice is whether you're talking to someone who's doing a single-season league or a keeper league. Though these days in score sheet, you know, I don't know all the rules of all our private leagues, but I'd guess that two-thirds of our leagues have some sort of keeper rules. So most of the time now when I talk to people, I'm trying to kind of keep in mind they probably are playing for more than just this season. For sure. And there are certainly variations. We, we actually play in a variation of leagues. All of our leagues are keeper leagues. Some of them are very soft keeper restrictions, so we only keep two to three players, which is just a very different experience than keeping 13 players the way you do in a standard public league, and certainly impacts your draft strategy. Yeah, I do think that sometimes people, they're in a keeper league, so you have to plan for years ahead, but, you know, I I try to draw the line at drafting the 16 and 17-year-old that's not projected to be in the majors (laughs) for six years. You know, it's... um. 
that flags fly for everything is also true. And so I don't mind rebuilding for a year, but I want to think that at least one year from now I'm going to be competing again. I certainly share your hesitation. We kind of caution against it. Uh, I think there is a tendency to, uh, you know, want to get the drop on the player, want to get the next great young player, someone like Rafael Devers, for instance, in the um, Boston Red Sox system, who, by all accounts, is uh, on his way to at least semi-stardom. He's also 17. So yeah. what you're saying is, okay, I am going to take him now, and I'm going to nurse him. And what does that mean in your keeper league? That generally means that you, he has to get through low A, he has to get through high A, he has to get through double A, he has to get through triple A. That's spending four drafts of your 28th round pick in many leagues, if that's the format. So when you're making that pick, you have to say, okay, he is worth four 28th round picks and the possibility that he comes in to the league, even if he's a great prospect and is not ready. And then you have to keep him as a anchor on your team for another two to three years. As you mentioned, if they come up and their first year in the majors are not so great, then you tell you have to tell yourself, well, I've kept him four years. I don't want to cut him now. But now you have to spend a regular major league protection spot on the guy. So my main theory, actually, I like drafting some of those guys if I'm in a league where there's a lot of trading. Because then if I have the hot 18-year-old, I can trade him for the 33-year-old Adrian Beltre and hopefully win the league that year. I, I think that's a viable strategy. Yeah, I, I, we've been, actually, that's another thing we talked about last week, that on our podcast, that for many players, these, I think, especially like low-level pitching prospects, which are the brick and mortar of your top 100 prospect list, which are valuable in pieces of, of information. You know, I wouldn't say, it, tons of work goes into those top prospect lists, but the pitchers on there are not top 100 values necessarily. They may have more value to you as a trade target or as a trade chip for what their name means, for what their recognition means, than they do as an intrinsic player on your team. Yeah, I mean, it was Gary Huckabee, who was one of the couple guys that started <laughs> Baseball Prospectus 27 years ago. I mean, what was his phrase? Tin step. There is no such thing as a pitching prospect. Right, which often gets misinterpreted, that people tend to think, oh, that means that pitchers get hurt a lot. No, that's not quite, I think, what the intent of the discussion was, that there's no pitching prospect. There are only pitchers. Pitchers do not get better automatically. They do not get better just because they're getting older. They don't improve regularly the way that hitters do. They kind of, I would say more, when an improvement comes, it tends to be punctuated and very specific, and that pitchers can often reach a new plane such as, let's say, Corey Kluber. Yeah, no, Kluber's a good example. I think you're right. Hitters seem to, they progress. They get older. You know, people get stronger between 18 and 25 usually. I'm not sure that helps. And the pitcher, it's such wear and tear on your shoulder to throw that, you know, it's, a lot of pitchers, they don't increase their velocity once they get to be 18 or 19. That's pretty much as fast as they're going to throw most often. Yeah, in some ways, like, very often people are interested in, oh, let me get the hot pitcher. I liked uh, Jacob deGrom, for instance, coming into last year because he was 25. You know, there's something to be said for the 25-year-old pitcher. This year, uh, again, we were talking about, let's say, Sean Nolan of the uh, Oakland Athletics. He was traded from the Blue Jays in the offseason. He's somebody who's not going to appear on a lot of top 100 lists because he just doesn't have this top-end potential. What he is is a triple-A pitcher who's probably ready to give you solid innings now and that's the kind of player who we think is more valuable in a score sheet draft than perhaps some of the players who are on the top 100 list yeah i like nolan for a couple reasons one of which is just i'm not really an a's fan being a giants fan but i have learned that i'm going <laughs> to trust billy bean you know I, when he traded for casimir a year or two ago I, I was like oh i think i'll draft that guy even though he'd burned me in the past and i think nolan's going to be uh, you know, a pretty solid pick because you're not going to have to draft him in the first round after keepers or anything. You're going to get him in the 20s sometime and maybe get a pretty good fourth or fifth starter. Exactly. And that's the kind of thing that we'll be recommending in the draft is looking for those fourth or fifth starter opportunities. Did Kendall Graveman, you know, the other pitcher traded, is he available, let's say, in the 20th round? Is somebody like perhaps Tim Cooney of the St. Louis Cardinals, is he available in a supplemental draft there are always pitchers who are breaking into the big leagues who you don't know about right now 
none of us, but prospect towns and family members know about who are going to deliver solid average seasons. Yeah, especially in season, picking up relievers that kind of come up from the minors and they're throwing 97 miles an hour and they're striking a guy out an inning and, you know, you can pick them up in the 39th round and get 40 or 50 valuable innings out of them. Yeah, I mean, this is the last year of the low strike zone, everyone. Let's take advantage of it. Yeah, before they change the... I guess that's one way to get offense back in Major League Baseball. They tell the umpires that anything below the thighs is a ball. I'm looking forward to it. It will increase scoring. Well, you know, along with these guys writing columns and doing podcasts at Baseball Prospectus, the, the BP folks for a couple of years now have had a, a score sheet draft aid where if you're a BP subscriber and you, you enter just your league and your team number and their program will read in your roster, it'll keep track of the web draft as it goes on, and it'll actually suggest who they think you might want to take with your next pick, which is some pretty cool stuff. And once in a while, you, you end up getting a suggestion. We go, oh, yeah, I'll take that guy. And then he goes on to be your third starter. Absolutely. I mean, I think this is the part of BP that I can recommend perhaps most unhesitatingly, perhaps because I have nothing to do with it. But I do believe that every score sheet player who's serious about their game should be a BP subscriber. And that is, believe me, our columns aside, the score sheet draft aid and team tracker and the SSM formula are probably the best score sheet related tools out there. The team tracker during the season, because the, the BP program will read in your roster and tell you what your guys did in real life yesterday and this week. And plus they have, you know, the BP strength for 20 years has been all their columnists, but now the last two or three or four years, they've really become a fantasy aid, especially for score sheet. Yeah, you're gonna get great columns throughout the year again, Perhaps us excluded. You get uh, there was a fantastic column this week about catcher defense, for instance. Beyond that, I mean the score sheet draft date in particular. So you know that's something that we refer to all the time when coming up with our next pick. Let's see what the draft date has to say. So what you do is you just type in the league that you're in. This is a program that Rob McCune and I think our own Ben Murphy, one of my colleagues, worked on, and the program just pulls in your score sheet information and ranks players by this value called SSSIM. It's a proprietary number that kind of weights all of the factors of score sheet, sort of the offense, the defense, the range rating, error ranking, which a lot of people don't consider, the fielding. I think this was originally a number originally developed by Nate Silver, which I think certainly we can all say that was the most important thing that he has ever contributed to American society, right? Yeah. Score sheet's more important than <laughs> presidential elections. I'll go with that. No, it's people really like it. And, you know, there's a lot of, obviously there's a ton of websites you can get advice from and all, and there's some really good things out there. But it is kind of nice to have score sheet specific stuff because if you make the mistake of going by rotisserie dollar values, or if it's, you know, certainly for you folks that maybe it's your first year of playing score sheet, there's a big difference between drafting for rotisserie and drafting for score sheet. I, I always like to say for score sheet, you draft players you'd like to have on your favorite real major league team. Whereas for rotisserie, you need to worry about stolen base categories and steal categories and save categories. So 100%. There are a lot more people out there who are keeping Billy Hamilton this offseason than I would recommend, for instance. He's a very nice roto player, but... He might uh, actually be a slightly better score sheet and real life player this year than I thought he would ever be. That's true. But he's always going to be far more valuable. My brother David says that one of the main impetuses for him writing this program was because when Rochesterie first started, Vince Coleman was the number one pick in every National League because he stole, he won you the steal category by himself and he got a ton of runs scored. And my brother just thought that was ludicrous. And, you know, to draft. Vince Coleman over Mike Schmidt. So he thought, I'm going to design a fantasy game where Mike Schmidt is clearly the number one pick of the league, not Vince Coleman. And, I mean, I like rotisserie, and that's how most of us started playing. But you do have to remember that those dollar values do not translate very well. You know, it's funny that I, for the most part, I, I play rotisserie casually, but I, did, I didn't play fantasy baseball with any depth of seriousness until I found Sporgeek. And for somebody who you know, is interested perhaps more in the narrative of sports, it's easier for me to just, oh, 
uh, you know, this is how valuable the player is, and keep that in my head, then have to come up with, oh, here's one number for real life, and then here's where he is batting in the batting order. Here's where, you know, his opportunities for score or driving in runs or scoring runs or stealing a base because he has a manager who is aggressive to some weird extent. I just don't have to think about those things. And as somebody who doesn't like to have to think about complicated things, I really enjoy this. Those are the kind of things I don't want to have to think about too much, whether the player I've got on my team suddenly is going to lose value because his manager doesn't like to steal as much as the guy that just got fired. Well, it's been great talking to you, Ian. And folks, if you've never been to the BP website, I'd say give it a shot. You know, there's free stuff. You can kind of check it all out. And then there's all this stuff that's, if you become a subscriber, it's not exactly exorbitant. I will also recommend, you actually don't need to be a subscriber to follow our podcast. You can just subscribe through iTunes. It's the same, uh, I would say the same podcast format that brought you Serial also brings you our podcast. Huh. So. Well, that's, yeah, no, like I said, I think that anyone that goes to BP will be quite happy. And certainly if you're there, yeah, listen to one of these score sheet podcasts or read one of the columns. You guys call it the true out, three true outcomes? The Three True Outcomes Score Sheet Baseball Podcast. It is a uh, bad joke that we have kept around for 15 years, which is our favorite kind of joke, based upon, for those of you who are fans of the old Usenet groups, players who strike out, hit home runs, and walk too much, you're Rob Deers of the world, who I think we should all keep in our hearts. Yeah, Rob, Rob Deer. I hadn't thought about him in quite a while. Well, hey, and thanks very much for being on. Thank you for having me, Jeff. It's been great.